Thank you, um, Elena, for that warm introduction. It is a pleasure to be here on this beautiful campus on a, such a beautiful day uh, and to see all your faces and it's, it looks like a full house. Uh, what you see here is a poem by one of America's illustrious poets, Langston Hughes. And it references um, possible outcomes when a society is unjust. And I use this as a metaphor of the conditions that made civil rights, made the civil rights movement of the 20th century not only necessary, but also inevitable. And I like to characterize these conditions as a series of dreams deferred, beginning with the Emancipation Proclamation. And if you'll bear with me a minute, I'm gonna try to get to that visual. Um, from the earliest days of the President Lincoln's administration, abolitionists and members of his party and freedmen had urged the President to, well, the President and Congress to seek full emancipation of all of the slaves. But Lincoln's proclamation only freed those slaves in the Deep South the states that had seceded from the Union. And Mr. Lincoln, through this proclamation, continued to hold in bondage those slaves in the border states where the president had authority to set them free. So Mr. Lincoln chose, however, to reward the slave owners in those states for their loyalty and disregarding the moral issue of slavery. For the slaves who were hoping for freedom, this was a dream deferred. Now, let's see if I can, excuse me just a minute. This is a map of the coast. Uh, the, oops, I'm, oh, I gotta put it on pause. Excuse me for a minute. This is a map of the east coast of the United States. In January of 1865, there was a special field order, number 15, coming from uh, Lincoln's, well, coming from U Ulysses S. Grant, who was in charge. This order stemmed from a promise of 400,000 acres of abandoned and confiscated lands along the coast of South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, which you see here, which extended 30 miles inland. These lands were to be divided into 40-acre parcels and settled by approximately 18,000 freed slave families and white Southern Unionists. Some black and white families began immediately to occupy and till these lands. However, the order was short-lived. It was a short-lived promise for the slaves. Three months after these orders were in operation, President Lincoln was assassinated. And in the fall of 1885, President Andrew Johnson revoked the order, and the black families were forced to leave. The lands were then made available only to whites. To the black families and other, this was another dream deferred. And let's see if the next one will do what it's supposed to do. This is a copy of the 13th Amendment of the Constitution. This was uh, enacted in 1865, and it forbid the condition of slavery for all persons in the United States 
except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted. This second clause in the 13th Amendment created a legal loophole that specifically permitted slavery to continue. Within months of the passage of this amendment, every southern state enacted an array of interlocking laws intended to criminalize black life. Numerous former slaves were arrested, falsely charged, convicted, and placed into a prison industrial slavery system. And the vestiges of this still exist today. For example, our participation in the Freedom Rides began in New Orleans, Louisiana. The day before we left Louisiana to go to Jackson, Mississippi, the black Freedom Riders in our group were warned, do not appear in public with less than a dollar on your person. We wondered why, and that's because that would constitute the crime of vagrancy for which any black person could be arrested, charged, and placed into involuntary servitude. So for all African Americans, another dream was deferred. The period of Reconstruction, which began actually before the Civil War ended, it was from 1865 to about 1877, a period of about 12 years. The 14th Amendment was enacted during this period, in fact, in 1868. And it guaranteed the right to due process and equal protection to anyone born in the United States. But during this and during this brief period, freedmen and former slaves briefly exercised their rights and became accustomed to liberty and freedom. They voted, they held political office, they married legally, they re reunited with family members who had been sold away during slavery. But gradually and with limited resources, they founded churches and social organizations, and with the help from northern philanthropists and some progressive whites, they established schools and colleges. This is the original Abyssinian Baptist Church, and this is Howard University, which was established at that time. Some even opened small businesses. In less than two decades, some managed to become doctors, legislators, magistrates, teachers, undertakers, and landowners. But in the late 1870s, the next president, Rutherford B. Hayes, abandoned Reconstruction and he began to withdraw federal troops from the South and ended oversight of the Southern state governments. The nation turned its interests to further industrializing the North and conquering the West. And the white South, left to its own devices, took the law into their own hands in outright defiance of the 14th Amendment. They used the rope and the rifle to dismantle the freedoms granted by the 14th Amendment. Some of you are so young, you might not know those two slides that I just showed. They were people being lynched. Southern legislator, legislatures began to write new laws sanctioning the separation of the two races and strengthening white supremacy these measures were known as Jim Crow laws, and some of you may have heard of them. These were passed in every southern state and applied to every facet of life. 
There were, for example, segregated lunch counters, segregated prisons, segregated public parks, segregated restaurants, segregated cemeteries, segregated hospitals. Blacks reacted with disbelief and denial and belated resistance to the rising hysteria of white supremacism, supremacism not knowing and unable to even imagine how far it would go. And clashes with the races occurred almost daily and the atmosphere of tension in which black people lived made their lives a constant struggle for survival. I missed a, a video there. Now, for more and more Americans, black Americans, that was another dream deferred. The 15th Amendment of 1817, which guaranteed all male citizens the right to vote, white Southern politicians ignored the 15th Amendment altogether. They campaigned and won political office on the issue of white supremacy. They formed secret militant organizations such as you see here, uh, known as the Ku Klux Klan and the Knights of the White Camellia. And through violence and intimidation, they gradually regained power near the end of the century. They revised their state constitutions in ways that effectively disenfranchised blacks. Mississippi led the way at their constitutional convention in 1890, writing an amendment that imposed a poll tax and excluded voters convicted of bribery, burglary, theft, arson, perjury, murder, murder vagrancy, or bigamy. It also barred anyone who could not read any section of the state constitution or understand it when it was read or give a reasonable interpretation of it. Now, whether a voter passed this test or not was determined by the white polling official. South Carolina followed Mississippi in 1895 with similar provisions in its constitution. And it also required a voter to own land. Many blacks at that time did not, could not pass that test. And if a white person couldn't pass that test, it was waived. Louisiana followed in 1898 and added a new device, the grandfather clause, which provided the vote only to those whose grandfathers or fathers had been qualified to vote in 1867. Blacks were still, were fresh out of slavery at that time and had not voted, and so they could not pass that test. In subsequent years, other southern states followed, and by 1910, blacks were effectively barred from voting by constitutional provisions in every southern state. So another dream was deferred. Without the black vote, white state and local governments enacted every law possible to discourage normal relationships between the races. Blacks and whites were separated on trains, in buses, in the depot waiting rooms, on train platforms, on parking lots, in taxi cabs. That's parking taxi cab. And of course, drinking fountains. There were separate drinking fountains and theaters had uh, separate entrances. Blacks had to go around to the back. Amusement parks, roller skating rinks, bowling alleys, swimming pools, tennis courts were strictly for whites only. And in 1883, after the US Supreme Court overturned the Civil Rights Act of 1865, ruling that it only applied to states and not to individuals, blacks were then banned from or segregated in all businesses. 
many, many more dreams were deferred. By 1885, most southern states had laws requiring segregated schools, and this is one example. And in 1896, the Supreme Court upheld segregation in its separate but equal doctrine set forth in Plessy versus Ferguson, a doctrine which stood for nearly 60 years, a major, major dream deferred. By 1905, every southern state outlawed blacks from sitting next to whites on all public conveyances. Alabama went a step further and required total, totally separate streetcars for whites and for blacks. By 1909, a new curfew required blacks to be off the streets by 10 o'clock. And in this case of this illustration, this is one of many cities which did not allow blacks to live there at all. By 1915, black and white workers in South Carolina, for instance, could not work in the same room or even go up or down the same stairway at the same time. In courtrooms, there were separate Bibles to swear to tell the truth on, and blacks could not testify against whites. Need I say, more dreams deferred. With all these dreams deferred, blacks did what humans have done for centuries. When social and economic conditions became untenable, they did what the pilgrims did under the tyranny of British rule, what the Jews did during the spread of Nazism. They did what human beings looking for freedom throughout history have done. Almost six million African Americans left the South to rebuild their lives in the North and the West. This is an illustration of one such family some of them walked. These were the conditions that made the 1954 Supreme Court decision in Brown versus Board of Education necessary. These are the conditions that made the Montgomery bus boycott necessary. There you have an integrated school. These were the conditions that made the sit-ins necessary in 1960. And this is the initial group that sat in at Woolworth's lunch counter. And this is some of the treatment that some of the people sitting in received from the whites as they sat waiting for and hoping for a cup of coffee. These were the conditions that made the Freedom Rides of 1961 necessary. And this is an illustration of the bus that was burned in Anniston. This is the bus that was bombed in Montgomery. These are some people preparing to go on the Freedom Rides. And this is Dr. Singleton when he was arrested. And this is me. These were dreams deferred. These are the dreams of which Dr. Martin Luther King spoke on that memorable day, memorable day in, in 1963. And these are the conditions that made the civil rights movement of the 20th century not only necessary, but inevitable. And I'll turn this over. Good afternoon. Come on, you knew better than that. Good afternoon. <laughs> better, much better. I know my wife is uh, a lot more photogenic than I am, and uh, usually she gets, uh, she gets a much better response. Um, there's, um, there, were, there, were, there were some dreams deferred outside the South, too. When my wife and I went to 
UCLA, um, after I had done a stint in the Army, I was disappointed when I got uh, to, from Philadelphia to Westwood. What I discovered in Westwood was that there was a lot of de facto segregation. There was a lot of covert um, discrimination. And uh, because at that time we didn't have a car, uh, and Westwood is so far to the west of Los Angeles, where there were very few uh, black people living, we found we couldn't live anywhere near campus. When we tried to apply for an apartment, for example, they would tell us, oh yeah, the apartment's open when we call up, but when we went over there, they'd tell us, oh, I'm sorry, we just let it go. Um, and when they, we tried to, I tried to get a job, um, they would say, oh yeah, th this job is open. And then when I went to uh, start walk into uh, uh, to the place where the, of employment, sometimes they have a big sign up there saying uh, equal opportunity employer. When I showed up, they said, oh, we, we, someone just uh, got that job, I'm sorry. Um, so I was um, not the kind of person who would take that lightly. I found there were a lot of people on campus who felt just like I did, that uh, we should do something about that. And we discovered that there was, there had been an attempt to get an NAACP chapter on campus, but it had not succeeded at that point. So I got myself elected president of the UCLA NAACP, and on the grounds that we, we need to do something about that, try to get the chapter on campus. And sure enough, um, once we went through the, all the motions, we got the chapter on campus. And the N UCLA NAACP immediately started organizing people to go and do something about the discrimination in Westwood. And uh, we had some slides that have those on there, but somehow they got, they got mixed up. Uh, but we, we, what we did is, um, as we would send a, a black couple in to ask for an apartment, or, or a black person to go in and look for a job, and, uh, and, they, uh, and they get turned down, then we would send a white person right behind them, who have, in every respect uh, was just as, um, okay. Go ahead, keep talking. Okay, in every respect was, <laughs> was just as, uh, was identical with, that, with those black people except for skin color. And of course, when the person who was white got the job, excuse me, there, um, we would then all go in and we'd begin to try to explain to the people that unlike the South, in the North there were laws that they were violating, they were breaking, and we could take them to court. And we were, we were having a lot of success at this. So we, um, this, this is a picket line that we began to, when, when they wouldn't comply, we would set up a picket line in front of their, in front of their place, and we would get people from the community who would join us, um, the student, who join us students. This was a, at this point, this was a Congress of Racial Equality group. There's a side, I, I should say that, UCLA did not like us to walk around with picket signs saying, UCLA, NAACP, protests segregated housing. <laughs> um, so they called me in and they said, look, um, call yourself anything but UCLA, NAACP. You can call yourself Bruin, NAACP, or Westwood, NAACP. And so we decided, oh, we'll get a Congress of Racial Equality chapter started. And this was in Santa Monica, which was not far. In fact, we were living in Santa Monica at that time. It was the closest we could get to campus. And this was one of those things that, um, we were supported by state officials. They, they would send observers down, and they would, they would promise us if we stayed within, our, our stayed within the law that they would, they would help us see these things through. We had a tremendous amount of success uh, accomplishing these kinds of uh, things. Uh, why don't you go to the picture of the officers of the... This oh, was another, that was, that, was a, that was another picket line out in front of a place that did not, um, um, Allow blacks. This was this was the um, believe it or not that Congress of Racial Equality group. Unlike the NAACP group, we had people from the community um, come in, and that's me when I had hair on the uh, <laughs> and and the uh, and the others were, um, were were community people who who had various offices. I was chairman. The fellow to the uh, to the uh, to the to the uh, to the left is. Uh, uh, was, was the treasurer, and uh, the secretary was the woman in the middle, and, and we, had, we had various other officers on there. In any event, we found that with, the, with this success that we were having, we were able to break down a lot of the discrimination that was going on in Westwood. But the, that's about the time that the sit-ins occurred down south. And we began to set up sympathy picket lines for those students down south. How many of you know what the sit-ins were? Okay, the sit-ins were, of course, were taking place at national chain stores in the South that had 
had stores also in the north and the west. And um, the students who would go to those, those uh, counters and they would be, uh, they, they would be uh, refused service. So we would go to, the to those same chain stores on, on, in Los Angeles and near, <coughs> near UCLA and we would pick at them. And then, of course the owner would say, well look, I don't discriminate, why are you picking at me? And we said, we want you to tell the managers of the, and, and the boards that run the entire national chain to uh, have a policy, a nationwide policy that does not segregate in the South. And they say, well, the laws and customs in the South are different from the laws and customs of the North and West, so we, we can't do that. But we, we, how many of you have ever seen a Woolworth store? Where did you see it? There it is. In Santa Barbara. Okay. They, they're used to, they're, they're used, Woolworth stores used to be um, sort of the Kmart or the target of the entire country. Why do you think there are not very many Woolworth stores around? I don't see, I don't think there's any in Los Angeles. Um, and they haven't been for a long time. We had, we hit them in the pocketbook. They still exist in England. That's where they came from. They came from London. And they're still, if you go to London now, you'll still, you'll still, still see Woolworth, Woolworth stores, but they've been overtaken by other stores that are more along the line of, of Kmart and, uh, and, and the other giants that have, uh, that, that have uh, outcompeted them. In any event, what I'm getting to here is that with the success of the sit-ins, we still felt we weren't doing enough to um, really accomplish what we felt should, should be happening nationwide. That the, that the people who were sitting in in the South were facing um, the enemy head on. And we were, with these sy sympathy picket lines, we were just sort of um, yeah, wishing them well, but we weren't, we weren't really exposed to the kind of dangers they were. And then the Freedom Rides started. As a result of a, of a, 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 a ruling by the United States Supreme Court saying that that the, uh, this, this, is the, this was the first Freedom Ride. Um, the first Freedom Ride actually took place in 1946, before the Freedom Rides as you know it, the 1961 Freedom Rides. This was the journey, what they call the journey of reconciliation. The Supreme Court at that time ruled that in a case called uh, Morgan versus Virginia, that buses that were in interstate commerce, any, any vehicle that was in interstate uh, uh, tra transit could not be segregated because that violated the interstate commerce uh, clause. Uh, and, and, uh, and, they, um, and the Interstate Commerce Commission had, had ruled that they could, not, uh, they, they could not be segregated. But local laws and customs says that they were to be segregated. And, so the, and the president at that time, uh, it was Eisenhower, I suppose, he, he, didn't, he didn't enforce the, uh, the uh, Supreme Court ruling. The Supreme Court by itself, of course, can't enforce the ruling. It takes the executive. It was Truman. Uh, it was Truman. Thank you. My wife just corrected me. Um, <laughs> and, and in fact, um, and so, the, so the Fellowship for, for Reconciliation, the Journey of Reconciliation was a failure. They went, they went um, to a couple of stops. They got, they got stopped. They got, by, they got assaulted. And, uh, and they realized that they weren't, they weren't going to have any uh, success at that. In 1960, a similar case came up. And this was um, a case called Boynton versus Virginia, in which the, uh, the Supreme Court ruled again that you could not segregate uh, not only on the bus or the buses and the other vehicles in interstate commerce, but you could also not segregate in the facilities where they stopped, where they where they uh, the waiting rooms and the and the uh, and the restaurants could not be segregated. They were in interstate commerce. Uh, and the, um, of course, the local laws and customs said they, they were going to uh, continue to segregate. And the um, Congress of Racial Equality, again, attempted to push the president to, in fact, uphold the law as, as mandated by the Supreme Court. This time, they got as far as Anniston, Alabama, and you saw that bus, that, that, uh, that uh, th this background map shows you where a number of them went from the beginning, but you saw that burned out bus on a picture, on a slide that my wife showed you previously. And that burned out bus, they, the, the people who were on the bus um, had, had gone through uh, quite a few of these, um, these cities. When they started in Washington, D.C., you see at the top of the map, 
and they got down um, all the way down to, uh, they, they had some difficulty, but they didn't run, and it, was, it was in Anniston, right about in the middle of the map, that you can see where they had the, the most violence uh, perpetrated against them, and in fact, they almost lost their lives. They, the people who, who uh, threw a Molotov cocktail into the bus, they slashed the bus's tires, first of all, then they threw uh, Molotov cocktails into the bus, then they tried to hold the bus doors closed so that the people on the bus, and it was like 60 or more people on the bus, they were trying to burn them up. They were trying to kill them. <coughs> they, they were hoping that this would send a message to the rest of the country that they didn't want their state and local laws broken, even though they were violating this, the, uh, the, the laws of the, of the, uh, that, that, the, the, that were um, uh, of the federal government, which, um, um, which, which supposedly in interstate commerce uh, uh, were, um <coughs> were the laws that prevailed. Since they didn't, um, but what happened, it was, it was very fortunate that the, the gas tank on that bus exploded before the people actually all burned up and died. When the gas tank exploded, the people who were holding the doors closed jumped back and the people were, and the Freedom Riders were, allowed, were, were able to get off. And, um, but they, they had a meeting right after that. All of the civil rights organizations got together and said, look, we, um, we've been approached by the, by the federal government, by the, by the Attorney General, in fact, to uh, please have a cooling off period. There is, at this point in time, uh, the chance that uh, the Klan and the, and the others who were trying to um, uh, stop the freedom rides, that they would, in fact, um, uh, continue to try to kill some freedom riders. So they wanted this cooling off period for that reason and for other reasons. The other reason being that Kennedy was, was trying to negotiate with Khrushchev about human rights. But he, he was in a weak position trying to talk Khrushchev about human rights in Russia and the Soviet Union, when in fact, in, in his own country in the South, there was a, the, 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 the human rights violations were taking place. As, as a result of that meeting, they almost called off the freedom rights. Except there was one group of students there about your age, and they said, if we call off the freedom rides now, then violence will have won. And you've taught us that, that um, nonviolence under Gandhian techniques should continue until we convince everybody that nonviolence is stronger than violence. The leader of the Na National Student Movement, which later became part of this, uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, um, was so um, determined to stay that President, uh, uh, Attorney General uh, uh, Kennedy's um, special assistant, his name was Siegenthaler, said, do you realize that some people are going to die if this happens? And she reached into her, into her, her pocket and she took out a piece of paper and said, we've already filled out our wills. We know we might die, but we want to keep this, we don't want violence to prevail over nonviolence, and all of us are willing to be those fresh troops, and we want to continue. Well, Siegenthaler realized that under those circumstances, he just called Bobby Kennedy and said, these people are not going to stop. There's not going to be a cooling off period. You better send some troops down, and that's what Bobby Kennedy did. He sent troops down, and they, they got out of Alabama, and, but when they tried to get into, into uh, Mississippi, Bobby Kennedy had a discussion with um, with the governor of Mississippi, Ross Barnett, and Ross Barnett said, let them come to Mississippi. We got something for them. And he said, you, you mean you go, you're gonna uh, violate, you, you're gonna attack them again? He said, no, we're gonna jail them in Parkland Penitentiary. And they will, I think that'll stop the Freedom Rides. Well, that's what they did. When the Freedom, when the freedom Rides got to Jackson, they were immediately arrested, and Bobby Kennedy told Ross Barnett, that's better than killing them. So they put, them in, they put the Freedom Riders in Parkland Penitentiary, and the word went out, we want to fill the jails in Mississippi. And the word got all over the country. And people your age, when they heard that, and we were your ages at that time, we, we, uh, we responded. And, we, and the, the Parkland Penitentiary is a huge place. They fill the city jails with no, t no time at all. They fill the county jails with no time at all. Parkland Penitentiary was huge, but they kept coming, 328 all together, and they, they, were, they, they, they recognized the, 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 the uh, people in Parkland realized they couldn't continue to hold them. When we got there, 
we, uh, I, I went out with some core applications to have people fill them out to uh, say that they were going to go. And I had 42 at one time. I had about, how many people in this room? About this, about this many. I had that many applications. And, um, but many of them were under 21. And when they went home and said, Mom, Dad, I'm going on a freedom ride, guess what happened? <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, you're not. Of course, and of course, many of them. My next door neighbor, uh, their daughter wanted to go uh, on a, uh, with us on a freedom ride. She was secretary of the NAACP. She, she felt that she had to go, but they said no. And she wasn't 21, so she couldn't go. We finally wound up with 17 people who went on the, um, with our group. And when we went, uh, we went by way first of, of New Orleans, uh, and then we uh, got some more training in New Orleans and nonviolence. And then we went across the, the, uh, the line, uh, the state line into Alabama, I mean into, um, into Mississippi. And we were, um, of course, told to go straight into the white only um, waiting room. And when you get there, you're gonna be accosted by the chief of police and he's going to arrest you. Well, we got off the bus, we got off the train, we were on a train. We got off the train and we went in. Uh, there was an ugly crowd out there. I was kind of glad to see the police, to tell you the truth. <laughs> because um, when we got into the place, we, we didn't know what was gonna happen. Um, and in fact, when I let Helen take the, take the rest of the story, I didn't want her to go, because I was, that's what I was afraid of. We had no idea what was gonna happen once we, we had seen the burning buses, we had seen the violence, we had seen the screaming people, Neanderthals on, on television. It wasn't, I guess it was television, you know, newspapers, but they were. It was television. It was television, too. Um, <laughs> but Helen, Helen. Um, I insisted. Insisted on going. Um, <laughs> there was, uh, again, it, would, it made no sense to me for him to recruit others who were your age, women and men, to go on this freedom ride and knowing that they might be injured and then to turn to me and say, but not you, <laughs> you know, you're, you're my wife, I don't want you to go and get hurt. But think, think, think of the dilemma I had. I had to sign a piece of paper saying I would be nonviolent under all circumstances, that if attacked, I would simply, you know, absorb the punishment. But there's my wife standing next to me. And my, my wife's father is shorter than she is was shorter than she is. But he's a tough little guy. And if he knew I stood there while someone was beating up a, his daughter, I'd never be able to go back to Philadelphia. I knew that. <laughs> <clears throat> that was part of it. The other part of it was that I was not Dr. King. I, did, I was not philosophically nonviolent. I was not Gandhi. I was tactically nonviolent. I was willing to be nonviolent for as long as it took to do what we were doing for our demonstration. But if I caught that same person around the corner the next day, <laughs> I was no longer in the demonstration, and something might happen. Um, that, is, that is not the, what the Congress of Racial Equality wanted us. That's not the way they wanted to be. They wanted us all to eventually grow to that level of philosophical nonviolence. I was trying, but under these circumstances, I knew that I was not going to, if, if someone tried to assault my wife. And, and the other problem was that in the final group that we went with, there was only one black woman. We knew that they were going to divide us in by race and by gender when they put us in the paddy wagon. We didn't know where the paddy wagon was going to go, but she was going to be, well, no, when they took us to jail. The paddy wagons took off with, with, with groups in them. But when we got to jail, to the city jail, she was by herself. And that wasn't fun, I can tell you that. However, before we left, as Bob mentioned, many of the uh, the people who had signed up, the students, mostly students, uh, had called their parents and asked permission to go. Bob and I were, um, he was 25, he was a graduate student, I was 28, and we didn't have to ask permission from our parents, but we did call them to let them know that we were going. And that was not an easy thing to do either because neither of our parents wanted us to do it. They just didn't have the authority to say we couldn't do it. In fact, my mother asked me, well, let me just tell you, one of the reasons I was going to go, no matter what 
Bob said, was because I had been raised, uh, my mother was from Virginia, and every summer as we were, as I was growing up, my mother would, and father would take us down to our grandmother's house, my mother's mother, to visit her. She had a little farm down there, and it was uh, in Lawrenceville, Virginia, about, um, about 17 miles north of uh, the North Carolina border. So we had to go deep into Virginia. Um, that's my mom. And this is the trip from Philadelphia to um, Virginia. And back in those days, there was no interstate highway system. So my father, who was always um, working on a car of some kind, um, well, first of all, my mother would have to be up all night cooking chicken, rolls, potato salad, whatever other vegetables she could for a family of eight, because I'm number three of eight kids. And, and over those years, just as often as not, she was pregnant with the next one. And so she would complain that, that this was really difficult, but we were going to see grandma. But this sort of spoiled the trip, so, you know, spoils your summer vacation. And I could always feel the tension in the car. Uh, that's my father. He was always good at putting cars together. And so we, we never had a new car. That's your father in the middle. Right? Oh, that's my father in this hat bending over. And there's the car. He did a pretty good job. So we would get in the car and go down to Virginia after my mother had been up all night. And I could always feel the tension in the car because here was a man with his wife and his family who was really helpless if anything should happen to us on those back roads. And we couldn't stop and get taken care of, uh, waited on at a restaurant. We couldn't stop and go to the bathroom. We'd have to pull over to the side of the road. And this sort of bothered me every year when we went down because, it, like I said, it sort of spoils your vacation. And after you get down there, there was always these signs, which I've shown you previously, indicating where you can't go and what you can't do and when you can and cannot do it. And this was what I grew up with. And in 1954, I was uh, back up in Philadelphia, and I had already graduated from high school. We were sitting there in my girlfriend's house and watching her TV, and uh, the program was interrupted with the announcement that the Supreme Court has ruled in the case of Brown versus Board of Education that the segregated schools uh, are not constitutional. And that was another surprise to me, that even they, they don't even go to school together down there. And after Bob and I got married, shortly after we were married, there was the murder of Emmett Till. I don't know if, have any of you heard of that? By show of hands, some of you have heard of the Emmett Till murder. Oh, okay, oh, yeah. It, it was a brutal murder of a 14-year-old down in, uh, I think it was Alabama or Mississippi, it was Mississippi. He was from Chicago and didn't realize, I suppose, that he shouldn't look at or say anything to a white woman when he got down in Mississippi. And that sort of tears at your heart also. And then we, we went overseas. Bob was in the service, and uh, we were sent to Germany. And we traveled around the Europe a while, and we saw a lot of, met a lot of people from other parts of the world. And we realized that white people in other parts of the world are not the same as the white people here in the southern part of the United States, particularly in the southern part. We also met people from Africa who's, who were part of the rebellion going on in their own countries to achieve independence from uh, European countries. And they would look at us and say things like, well, you people there, you black people there in the United States, why don't you do something? Um, these were the kinds of things that when Bob told me, no, I don't want you to go, it just wasn't going to fly with me because I was ready. 